Hey, it's Lee. Welcome to Business Problem Solved. Today, I have the absolute pleasure of having another guest join me, Mr. Philip Holt. How are you, Philip? I'm doing very well, Lee. Thank you very much for having me on the uh, on the podcast. I didn't know which way was the best way to um, to introduce you. Author, um, operational excellence guru, senior vice president. How do you introduce yourself to people who have um, who, who have just met you for the first time? Well, normally, normally I introduce myself as Philip, but um, no, in all, in all seriousness, to your question, um, I, I normally talk about being a lean leader. That that's what's important to me um, about lean leadership, and that that normally sparks a question about what what does that actually mean? Yeah, no, I love that, and and that does that sparks that question in my mind. And then when you said that, because because um, we're both in the operational excellence space, and. And, and lean has, has is positively received in some quarters and negatively in others. Um, so before I ask you my typical very first question, um, what does lean leader mean to you? Lean leader to me means somebody who's focused on making their organisation. Um, and I use the term organisation because it could be a for-profit organisation, it could be a social enterprise, or it can be a for-profit um, conventional business. Um, but whatever it is that you're working in there, your focus is on making that the best impact that it possibly can have on, on its people, it, the society and its customers. And then as an outcome of that, shareholders will benefit if it's a for-profit organisation. Um, if it's not for profit organisation, society as a whole will benefit even more. So it's about being focused on that. And a lean leader does that by understanding what their customer and stakeholders need, but by enabling the people who are doing that every day to do it the best possible way that they can, in a way that, in a way that is fulfilling for them, rather than causing them stress, anxiety, or, or in some cases trauma. So, and, and I use trauma in a, it's a bit of an emotive word, but I think for some people the work can be traumatic and. We need to get away from that. So a lean leader is about making people's work part of their life and, and, and ensuring that um, they're able to do it in a way that, that's fulfilling for them. Yeah, love it. Love it, love it, love it. If, in fact, I, if I go to question number one, because I think that's a really, really strong start what you just said there. And, and I guess to get to that point where, where you've got that clarity of understanding, you, you may or may not, I think it depends on this, this next answer, have been on a bit of a journey to get to that. So for those people who don't know who Philip Holt is, who is he and how has he got to that seat today? Yeah, so I think for, first and foremost, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a father and husband um, and, and that's kind of my primary focus in life is being the best I can at those, those roles. Um, but I, I, I'll probably talk a little bit more about this later, Lee, but you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I've come to a point where I, I started to understand what a life in balance is. We talk about work-life balance a lot, but for me, I, I don't like that term, and maybe we can talk about that later. But for me, it's about having a life in balance, and that means that the work part is something that's fulfilling, that you enjoy, that you get a lot from. And I've been on a long journey to get there. I started work at 16 in, in an apprenticeship. So I did an engineering and technical apprenticeship. And, and basically there's three parts to my career. The first part as an engineer. So I did my apprenticeship, became an engineer. Um, part of that was running operations for a while, but it was basically an engineering and technical role. Second stage in my career was um, supply chain and procurement. Mm -hmm. And then the third stage and, and kind of the phase that I'm in now is as this, this lean leader heading up operational excellence, lean deployments, whatever you want to call it. And it wasn't until I got to that third stage or third phase in my career that I really understood what being a good leader is all about. And I'm not saying that I'm there yet. I, I'm not going to be uh, <laughs> arrogant enough to say that I'm actually at that point of being the great leader I want to be. But I think I at least know what that vision is and what I'm aspiring to every, every day. Um, and, and, you know, the problem was in the two, first two phases of my career, being an engineer, being a logical mind minded person, it was always about the tools. It was very black and white. It was about the logic of we have objectives. 
here are the tools that we can apply. You know, I, I, I read the machine that uh, changed the world, lean thinking, all these different books back in the, um, the late 80s and 90s and, and felt, okay, I understand this lean. I got a green belt in Six Sigma. I thought, okay, I, I know how to do this. And then back in 2008, when we started in, in the company I was at at the time, Philips, um, we started Simply Philips, their lean deployment model. And I went to Japan for a couple of weeks. And it wasn't just being in Japan, it was the structure and, and the reflection that we got during that two weeks. But I realized going to some world-class companies and, and talking to the newly formed team and, and reflecting on what we've done, I realized that I knew nothing about lean at the enterprise and, and philosophical le level. I knew all the tools, mm. uh, thought I was good with the tools, but I didn't understand the philosophy behind it, why? And, and I think, you know, it, it's since then, I've, I've kind of grown myself as a leader. I've grown myself as a human being. Um, and and I, I think that I've got myself in a, a fantastic position in terms of understanding how to have that life in balance. And I think that's the journey I've, I've been on. And, you know, the, the books that I write now um, and, and the articles and, and when I speak about this is really a passion of mine, which is to try and help others to get to that position as well. Yeah, I've got so, so many questions. I mean, the first question that popped into my mind is why do you say books and not books? <laughs> because, because, Lee, I've been away from Bolton for so long and worked in an international yeah. company. But pe people still struggle sometimes with my accent. Um, yeah. very, very quick aside, when I used to run the end to end program for one of the divisions in Phillips, I went to Singapore and ran a ran an event and at the end of those three days we'd finished and the next day I, I was in having a coffee in the canteen and one of the women who'd been on the um uh, I was going to say course the event for for the past three days came into the coffee room and she said to me do you know what Philip she said I'm a massive Game of Thrones fan she said and until I heard you I, I thought the accent was made up uh, so, so pe people struggle a bit uh, enough with my accent anyway because it's not that typical uh, Queen's English um, and as a result of that I've, I guess I've modified it and I, I say things like books instead of boots. <laughs> yeah I mean, you've got a lovely accent Philip don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, <laughs> so, so I think when when you went to uh, and, that, and you set up Simply Phillips and, and you went over to Japan and and you said you didn't have a, um, a deep understanding of the uh, the, the, uh, the philosophical level of what lean meant. Were there any things or any in that in that reflection time? What is it that you that you saw that were maybe that some of the penny drop moments or the were there any critical things that made you realise that you actually didn't know what you thought you knew before going out? Yes, I, I think I, one of the funniest parts of that story was when, when we first joined, so the, the team was pretty new to each other. There was only the, the leader of the team and one person who knew each other. The rest of us were recruited new to his team and, and each of us didn't know each other. So it was kind of a really baptism of fire bringing us all together. Um, and then on the first day, we were asked to plot on a two by two X, Y, Basically, on the x-axis, how long we had in industry, and on the y-axis, on a scale of one to ten, how much of an expert do we think we were in, in lean? Um, so a lot of us had kind of, you know, 15, 20, 25 years of work experience. And then we kind of put ourselves, I, I think I put a six or a seven on my lean expertise, and that was me trying to be modest in the group as well. I, I, I thought at the time I was much higher than that, but I was trying to be modest. I put a six or a seven. There's a couple of guys who put seven or eight and, and so on. So that went on. And then about day four or day five, we had a speaker. It was an ex-Toyota guy who'd been, I think, 35 years with Toyota and run a couple of their largest factories. Um, and then he'd actually gone out, as they do in Toyota, with some of the most senior people. His, past, his last five years of his career was actually helping to run a factory for his supplier to help to improve the supplier's performance. And he'd retired and he did speaking engagements now. And, and he came in and he, he basically looked at this. He was just about to start talking and then he, he asked what that was in the corner and it was explained to him. So he walked over, he picked up a pen and he put himself as kind of 40 odd years plus experience 
but he put himself as a five. And, yeah. and basically, spontaneously, all of us got up from our seats. There was, what, 15, 16 of us got up from our seats, ran over there and all started putting ourselves ones and twos, you know, <laughs> changing our numbers. And it, it, and that, that was kind of a, a, a key moment, a watershed moment. But, you know, I, I reflected a lot on why a lot of the projects I'd run, the lean projects, Six Sigma projects, whatever they were, that I thought was successful, management had signed off and said, this is brilliant, we've saved X number of pounds or dollars or euros. This is great. When you really look back at them, they weren't sustainable. And I started to realise as I was there for those two weeks that we weren't, we were changing some parameters, we were changing some process characteristics. We weren't changing the value stream behaviour. We weren't changing the way that people worked around that value stream. And this just started to dawn on me, this realisation that I, there was so much that I didn't know. And I don't know whether you're familiar with the Dunning-Kruger curve, yeah. but, but I realised that I'd been sat on Mount Stupid, as they call it, for, <laughs> for a long time with, with Lean. And I started to quickly fall down the side of Mount Stupid and, and end up in that valley where you don't know what you don't know and your confidence is shot and you think, gosh, there's so much that I need to learn. There's so much I need to learn. Yeah. What is it that kept you going and wanting to learn? Well, I was I was fortunate because the team that we assembled was some fantastic people. We had a, it was a in, truly international team. It was working for Philips. So, you know, it's a truly global company. So the team that we assembled was truly global. We had people from a couple of different parts of Asia. We had from Latin America, North America, um, and different parts of Europe. So we, we had a, a truly global team that, um, that that had different ideas, different experience levels. We had, we had a great person, Claudia Landeris, um, a woman who was from HR, didn't claim to have any um, lean experience, um, but our, our leader at the time who, who brought this together, Craig Russell, recognised it was all about people. And, and so we had this, this organisational change expert, Claudia, who came in and, and just would talk to us about the impacts that, that anything we did had on people. So I was just learning so much. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Gallup Strengths Finder, um, but my number one is learner. So right. basically, I just want to learn all the time. Um, so, so it was a fantastic opportunity to learn and apply. Yeah, no, amazing, amazing. And and when you, you just said that it's all about people and people have come strong throughout your whole um, career so far when, when you've been sharing some of the, some of the learn, learnings and lessons. Have people always been important to you or is, is this something that's, that's developed over time? Yeah, that's definitely part of the journey. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's not that I've never cared about people per se, but again, it, early part of my career it was all about engineering you know the people were just part of the assets I guess um even talk about human capital don't we and and yep. people being our greatest assets and I think it's not very complimentary to talk about human beings as assets or, or capital is it you know I mean that people are people I mean at the end of the day you boil it down to why do we even have modern societies with industry um, and, and, you know, the elements of, of modern, the modern world that we have, it's ultimately there to serve people, right? It's there to generate wealth that helps us all to have a better standard of living. And, you know, in most developed countries, um, we also have a social system in place that helps those less fortunate to have at least a minimal standard of, of living. So, you know, ultimately all boils down to serving society and serving people. Um, so we've, you know, we've got to be much more focused on that. And I think that's something that was always there. I mean, I would consider myself somebody who believes in, 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 in society and in people. And, and you know, and I, I love my family and I love my friends and my, my, my extended family. But I guess at work, I almost switched off that part of myself and got into engineering mode. And, and again, that's one of the things with what I call this life in balance is, you know, stop separating work and, and life, you know, work life balance. It's a life in balance. Take yourself everywhere and be yourself wherever you are. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And, and we're not really scratching the surface of it. There's so many things that we could go deeper 
um, into, into all of these different concepts that you're talking about in terms of like uh, the people or life in balance. And, and I guess if, if I was to ask you to go, if, if somebody was starting their journey now in, in lean or within, in leadership and they wanted to be a, um, a lean leader, um, based on the definition that, that you provided earlier, what would what advice would you give them, and, and how would they start? Yeah, I think I think that's a really really great question. I think where you would start is stop trying to be what you think you have to be. I, I think one of the big problems with with companies, particularly corporations, when they become global entities, is people become you know, the, the authenticity of people gets lost sometimes. Um, and, and, and it almost becomes a bit of a cliche in, in companies. You know, you've got all these programs where people talk about bringing your real self to work or your true self to work, being authentic. And, and even that's disingenuous. You know, it's not, that's not authentic. And um, I think you have to really trust that you can bring your true self to work um, be the person you are. Obviously, you know, be professional. Um, you know, being professional doesn't mean you can't be yourself. Um, you know, apply good practices, apply whatever it is you need to do, but bring yourself to work, be you, um, and then apply the humanity in yourself to everything that you do. Um, I think one of the challenges is, you know, because because the natural thing to say next, though, as I was brought up, is treat others as you would treat yourself. But what's really interesting is one of the things I've learned, um, particularly over the past three years when we've been doing a lot of work with, with Gallup on Strengths Finder and on, you know, how, how talent assessment is. Actually, not everybody wants to be treated how I want to be treated. We're all individuals and we all have our, our own particular ways. So it's more about treat people as they need to and want to be treated. Um, find out about them, find out about the people you work with and, and who work for you and understand them. Um, and, and that's the only way you can be a really good lean leader, I think, is understanding people, what drives them, what motivates them and what's going to get the most out of them and give them the most and give them the most fulfilment. Yeah, amazing answer, amazing answer. When you're doing that on a, a grand scale like you are, because um, this, this is something that's... Uh, so um, I, I deliver a course called Overcoming Resistance to Change. And, and what you're saying really resonates with me because the first module of that is um, change starts with you. And then it's understanding yourself for the first three weeks that I go through. Because I often think that and see that people don't look in the mirror first. They look out the window at other people. Um, and one of the challenges that I get asked a lot is is because when I introduce other people into the mix and go, it's the, and, and trust and, and stuff, is they go, well, if that's easy on a, or easier on a one-to-one -one scale and a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but if, you, if you're trying to lead change across a huge, a global organisation like yourself, how do you find the balance between, or how do you get to know people on, at the level that you need to, to influence the behaviours that you're trying to? Yeah, and it, it is difficult, Lee. I mean, as, as COVID has shown us, I think... Um, you know, the pandemic has had a very positive impact, which it's, it's got rid of some of the traditional, what I call desk sitting um, practices where people think that if somebody's sat at the desk for 50, 60 hours a week, it means they're productive. Well, it, it doesn't. <laughs> so it, it's helped us to get this, this work from home or, or flex or open from more, many more people. That's, that's very positive. The negative side is I think that's gone... The, the pendulum swung too far and people aren't connecting enough on a human basis um particularly when you talk about um factories shop floors and um, places where people can't work from home where they have to be on location the people who support them need to be going there and spending some human time interacting with each other instead of sat behind a desk behind a computer screen so to answer your question, I think we've got to connect with people. You know, I spend a lot of my time traveling because I want to spend time with people to get to know them. But then again, what, what's interesting is I talk a lot about the people side and don't over-engineer things and don't think about the tools, but it's an and situation. So I actually use a lot of tools. We're using Office 5, for example, in my team. Uh, if you don't know Office 5, it's a, it's a way of getting very quick answers from teams, members. They answer one question every week 
and it builds a profile of how the team's feeling from an engagement perspective. It also gives the team an opportunity to write some comments anonymously or under their own name, that's the exact, entirely their choice, to give you some feedback on how they're feeling about things. So you can actually use tools as well to stay connected to people, but it's about just having that ongoing dialogue through different, different media um, and, and just, just focus all the time. Most of my time is spent thinking about the people who work for me and the organisation as a, as a whole. Most of my time is, is not spent on technical aspects, it's spent on people aspects. Yeah, I love it, love it, love it, love it. And I, I often find that it's, as leaders, it's finding better questions to ask than you've previously asked as well. So what you, well, that's what, in my head then, when you just said about the Office 5 thing, that's asking um, a question, but maybe a different question to what's been asked previously. And and, and I think that the, a lot a lot of the challenge that I see within organisations and, and leaders is they're asking the same questions um, all of the time. And, in, in, and I guess it's about trying to challenge them to ask better questions, to get better answers. Um, but I, I guess rather than me just leave that there, do you agree or disagree with what I've just said? And for what reason? Yeah, yeah, I agree with, with you, Lee. I think that there's too much... Even though technically it's two-way um, conversation, it's two-way feedback, it, it's led too much by the leadership. It's like you say, it's closed questions or repetitive questions instead of an open dialogue. And that, that's one of the things that I try to promote. And again, I'm not saying I'm perfect at this, but I'm trying to promote feedback that, that helps my team members and our wider teams to to bring to the fore what's their agenda, what, what matters to, to them. So within my team, so my, my direct team, I've got an extended COE, which is about 140 people, but my direct team um, on a direct reporting line are about 37 people, 38 people globally wow. dispersed. Um, and one of the things that's turned out that really matters to them is about diversity and inclusivity. Um, you know, and, and so that's a big agenda point for our team now. And our team meeting that's coming up in September, um, you know, a key focus of that, working with a couple of our DI specialists out of HR, will be to focus on the diversity and inclusivity uh, of our team and of the wider organization. And that was driven not by me, but by comments that came back via Office 5 from members of our team. And it's not that it's not important, but it's something that the organisation itself, GK and Aerospace, is driving quite heavily. It's a very important agenda item. So I guess I was passively allowing that to happen as part of the wider agenda. And my team have said, no, we want to be proactive. We want to be at the forefront of this. Let's do something ourselves in line with what the organisation is doing, but let's take a lead in this. So, you know, that feedback has, has driven our agenda now. Yeah, amazing, amazing. At the start, in your introduction, you mentioned an author as well. How many books have you written? And, and what was the reason that you started writing? Um, so so three, three books. Um, my first, Leading with Lean. Second one, The Simplicity of Lean. And then the one that publishes um, on the 26th of July, uh, which is Leading Lean by Living Lean. And basically, it's... Um, it, 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 the three books should cover what I, I can, you know, consider all aspects of, you know, wh why, why to do it, how to do it and, and the people side of it. Um, so, so I've got my kind of my triumvirate of, uh, of, of books now which cover that. And the reason that I wrote them, it's really a passion of mine to share my learning. I, I was doing a lot of speaking, going to conferences and speaking about my experiences deploying Lean across Philips. Um, and then about 2015, 16, I was approached by uh, one of the organisers of one of the um, conferences I was speaking at, who was also the uh, editor of, of the uh, publishing arm of that company. And he said to me, look, I love what you say. Have you ever considered writing a book? And I've been writing lots of articles. So I said, OK, yeah, let's let's give it a go. So I wrote the first two chapters, sent them to him. He said, I like this. So we had a, a couple of chats. I ended up writing the whole book about 80% of it written on planes whilst flying between factories. Um, 
and and it ended up being published as as leading with lean and and it was pretty successful i got a lot of really positive feedback and and ended up writing you know a lot of people said we love this it's about the leadership it's about how you lead it but we need to know more about the nitty gritty how do you actually do this so that's where the simplicity of lean came from and again even even more successful than the first book a lot of really positive feedback so i ended up saying okay what i'm missing now is the people side of it um need need to figure out this people side of it so as a result of that ended up saying okay let's write leading lean by living lean the emphasis on the living lean part about this is all about me it's not about what i need you to do lee it's about what i need to do to make this work and that that's where the uh, the kind of genesis of that came from love it if, if somebody was to read all three books or books as you know sir um <laughs> Uh, what would you hope that they would do different afterwards as they were doing from before? So what, what I would hope is that they, in the first instance, would feel so much better themselves about taking control of how they lead as a leader. Um, and, and just to quickly emphasise, when I talk about a leader, I'm not talking about somebody who's been given or assigned that position. Not talking about, you know, being the senior vice president. I've considered myself a leader right really from the beginning of my career. You know, I've got people who I can influence and impact and lead in the projects I do, in the work that I'm doing. So, you know, it's about whatever position you are in the organisation hierarchically, you know, it's about how do you behave in the organisation. So that's what I mean by a leader. So it's about... I would hope that they're a better leader, that they start to become a lean leader, that the life starts to go in balance, that they really start to get a life in balance so they can reduce their stress levels, be far more effective, both in their personal life as well as their professional life. And that ultimately they'll feel more fulfilled, that they'll start to see the results coming out. Because it is about business results, don't get me wrong. This is the best way I know to get the best business results and guess what? It's fantastic because people feel better about things. People are more fulfilled, you know, so you get that impact on employees positive. You get the impact on the business positive, society positive, and the shareholders are happy. So that's what I want individuals to be able to do, make that contribution and feel much better about it all. Yeah, I love it. After the book launch, um, or the, 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 the third one, what's next for you, Philip? So ca carry on making lean flyers, we say. We, uh, we, we, you know, our, our company's tagline is making things fly, and we we kind of play on words in that. We say making lean fly. You know, the the job I have is to help GK Aerospace to become the best aerospace company in the world. It, it's already technical technologically. I would argue the best tier one super supplier in the aerospace industry. Um, and we want to make GK Aerospace and this industry far better from an operational excellence perspective. And, and it's just to continue doing that and, and seeing, you know, smiles on faces of people who do the job um, because the way that they do the job has been improved by doing it through our lean operating model and they feel more fulfilled. So it's just just doing more, more of that um, and helping people to get better and, like I say, have their life in balance. Yeah, no, I love that, love that. If you were to complete the two by two that you mentioned earlier on, um, uh, years of experience and then knowledge of lean um, oh, on the scale of naught to 10 and so what, how would you, what would you complete it now? How would you complete that now? Um, I, well, years of experience now we're getting, I'm clocking a few of those up now. So <laughs> that might be getting over to the 35, 36 years mark. Um, no, but it, no, it's 30, 34 years of, of experience on the scale of one to 10. That's a really difficult one. But I think I'd, I'd probably be at a five or a six, to be honest with you, because I've still so much to learn. I've still so much to learn. I make mistakes every day and I learn from them and I've so much to learn still. What would make you a six or a seven? I, I think, to be honest with you, that that would be hitting some of the goals that we've got this year we've got um uh, if you're familiar with i'm sure you are Lee, with horsham canary policy deployment um 
I, I think if at the end of this year, or I'm going to say when, not if, when at the end of this year, we've, we've really hit successfully the horse and cannery targets that we had for this year around our um, quality improvement, safety improvements and value stream improvements. I, I think I'd probably be able to say I'm at a six or a seven at that point, because I'd say, look, we've done something special this year. Um, so I think that's what would take me up to that level. So during a couple of your answers so far, Phil, you mentioned life in balance. Um, and you said earlier on in the conversation, you don't like work-life balance. What's the difference and what does life in balance mean to you? Yeah, so I think many people do use the term work life balance with the right intent, but I do think that it can, I think it can imply the wrong mindset. And, and I think it ends up for many people being life and work as two kind of separate things. And the idea is work reduce, life increase. Um, and I think the danger with that is that you, you kind of devalue the time that you're actually at work. And if you think about it, you know, in a, in a full seven day week, there's 168 hours if my maths is correct. I'm working this off memory. So hopefully I've got my math right there. And if you have a good eight hours sleep every night for your seven days, that's 56 hours, right? So you're down to what's that, 112 hours of, of life every week where you're conscious, right? Yeah. Now, I think for most people, even if you're fortunate enough to work from home, you know, if you count the time that it takes you to get up in the morning, clean your teeth, wash, get dressed, ready for work, get behind your computer, etc., you're probably spending at least 40 hours, probably up to 50 hours a week. And if you've got a commute on top of that, if you're actually going into a factory or, or a workplace, an office, then you're probably more like 50 to 60 hours. And then the workaholics amongst us are maybe up at 60 or 70. So it doesn't take much to say that, look, to say that you're probably spending between 40 and 60% of your waking hours across a five day period of your seven day waking hours. I mean, that basically says that roughly half your life is at work. So if you devalue that time of your life and say that's the bad part of my life, the good part of my life is the life bit, yeah. then you're basically saying half your life is a waste. And now I'm probably being a bit black and white on that, but what I'm trying to uh, encourage with a life in balance is make the time that you're at work fulfilling, make it part of your life, make it something that you come out of thinking, yeah, I, I contributed today. I made a great job today. I did something that was meaningful today. I think that word meaningful is really important. So you basically have a life in balance. And, and I think that's so important. And that's what I want for people. That's what I think I've found for myself. And that's what I want for people. I don't want them to wake up on a mo Monday morning dreading going into work. I don't want them to get home from work or finish work and be stressed and drinking a glass of wine, not just to enjoy a glass of wine, but to de-stress. You know, I, I, I want people to have that life in balance. So it's about how do you manage your work in the right way how do you live lean so that you just feel fulfilled by what you do every day and i hate to see people i mean i still have people in my own team who i can see the work's impact in them and i'm trying to work with them on a daily basis to to say how do we how do we stop this impacting you negatively i want you to feel like you're smashing the doors in every day and 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 having a meaningful impact i yeah, love it love it you just um said you just back to another question actually and when you said 50% of your time at work, 50% of your time at home, and you mentioned earlier on about um, being authentic and bringing, being authentic in both of those, but it doesn't necessarily, you can still be professional, but authentically be professional at work. If, if you were to ask the people that um, work for you to describe you in three words, what would those three words be? Oh, that's a really good question. You should have prepped me for that one, Lee. Um, yeah, the next question is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably disciplined, focused, and I hope caring. Yeah, perfect. And if you were to ask the people who you live with that same question, what three words would they use to describe you? Uh, probably disciplined, focused, and I hope caring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
Amazing, amazing. No, I love that. I love that. What is it that gives you your discipline? Well, that's really interesting, again, because people would probably think that it's something I'm born naturally with. I'd need to check my Gallup Strengths Finder to see where it is, but discipline is not in my top five. It's certainly not in my top 10. Um, and and I, I don't even know if it's in my top 20. It's kind of mid, mid to bottom end. Um, so my natural um, element of discipline is not there. Um, I'm not a naturally disciplined person, which people would probably find very difficult to believe. It, it's it's because I think my learner and my achiever elements, and I'm an arranger and I'm analytical. Um, I think because of those kind of strengths, I've realised that the best way to be successful is to be disciplined. Um, you know, I'm not a natural early riser yet. There's a few people I've worked with you know, would say, oh, gosh, I hate traveling with you because you're always in the shop floor at seven in the morning. Um, well, the reason I get in there in that time in the morning is kind of respect for the people who are working on the shop floor because I want to go and be there. And, and if I need to be there at six o'clock, I'll be at six o'clock to see the tier one, the startup meeting, because I want to show them the respect of being there when they're doing it naturally, not ask them to do it later. So, but, but that's absolutely not my natural thing. If you leave me on holiday like I am this week, um, you know, I can easily sleep in till nine, 10 o'clock, no, no problem whatsoever. But when I'm at work, you know, I had a job where I was getting up at 4.30 every morning to drive to work. You know, I'll do it because that's what needs to be done. So I think it's just about me finding the best ways of working that give me that best life in balance and allow me to fill my fulfill my commitments to other people that that helps me to to be in that way yeah perfect perfect love it love it i could talk i could talk to you all day and unfortunately you're on holiday and uh, and, and so you've got in, more interesting things to do um you've mentioned being a learner uh, quite a lot through this conversation as well what's one thing that you would like to learn next oh so one of the things I'd like to learn next, and, and actually not because I work for an aerospace company, it's something I've been putting off for a while, but it's how to fly. So I'm, I'm planning on taking flying lessons and learning how to fly. Yeah, love that, love that, love that. And um, do you see yourself as successful, Helen? Absolutely. I've, I've got to see myself as su successful. You know, I've got... I've got a, a lovely wife, uh, Laura, who I've been married to for over 20 years and I've been with for over a quarter of a century. Um, I've got two lovely daughters, both adults now, um, and I've got a successful career. Um, and, and, you know, I deliberately put them in those that order. Um, and, and, yeah, and I've got some good, good friends and I live in a nice neighbourhood and, you know, I enjoy my life. So, yeah, I think, you know, if that's not a measure of success, I don't know what is. Yeah, no, completely. And, and, and you can see it in yourself as well. You, you, you light up when you talk about these things. And what is the secret of your success? I think, I think it's, as I said, trying to find fulfillment and meaning in what, what I do. Yeah. You know, I, we, we can't all, I mean, look, look, if I could click my fingers, you know, I'd love to be a, a top England footballer playing for uh, playing for one of the teams. Preferably for me, it would be Bolton Wanderers in the Premier Division, but we can all really dream. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, if, if I could click my fingers, that's what I'd love. And that, that'd that be great, you know, or it'd be great to be a rock star or whatever. You know, we, we'd all love to to be these, these really high profile, successful things. Um, but, you know, I think you can get meaning and fulfillment out of everything you do. I really do. You know, I mean, it's. I, I look to see anybody who's passionate at anything that they do. I, I think it's. It's really. I, I. I do. I actually love seeing anybody doing anything that they're passionate about. You know, even if you go and somebody's doing a a relatively mundane job, but you can see that they care about what they're doing and they care about making it work. I. I I've got so much respect for them. Uh, and I think that's about getting that life in balance because, you know, quite frankly, going in, clocking in to work and mourning all day about what you do. I mean, that that's such a waste of your life. It really is. Yeah. So how do you find meaning in life? I think that's the important key. Yeah. Love it, love it. I'm I'm going to go super super narrow now, just uh, and probably alienate a lot of people listening. But I went to watch um, Bolton versus Charlie in the preseason friendly, and I have to say, Bolton were very impressive. 
um, just about about a month ago. Very impressive they were. So um, hopefully the, the the season this season will be a good season for yourselves. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Um, what does a uh, um, G Classic? Are you, are you a best-selling author? Is that have you? Is it? Is it in, an author? What is it? Just an author? Is I'm, it an author? Best-selling author? How would you? I, I'm not going to say best-selling author yet. No, I'll I'll say author. Um, not yet. I, I have won. I have won an Axiom Award for the the simplicity of lean. Um, so I I got a bronze medal in that back in what was it 2020 or 2021. Um, but no, I'm not going to pretend I'm a best-selling author yet, but I'm an author of a book of three books and the first two have sold pretty successfully. I've given just, I, I mentioned to you offline, Lee, but um, I, I don't take any personal profits from, from the books that I write. It really is a passion to share my knowledge um, and everything I have goes to charity. Um, the, the current charity, I've done a number of charities, but this year's charity is, uh, is um, Women's Aid. Um, which uh, helps women and, and families, children who are um, suffering from domestic abuse. Um, but but overall, I've donated over ten thousand pounds so far in uh, wow. in my personal profits from the books um, to uh, to different charities. So I'm I'm very proud of that that part. And it's uh, so so I'm selling enough to uh, to give some decent money to uh, to some very worthy charities. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. Honestly, um, you've, there's, there's so there's so so many ways that this conversation could have gone, and and so many things that I, I could have asked, um, and so many things I, I still want to ask, but I'm I'm going to be respectful of your time and not go down so many different rabbit um, holes. I, I just want to say, um, Philip, as I'll, I'll call you an award winner. So I think an award. You just said you won an award. So what does an award winning author? Um, have for his tea before I before I close. What does an award winning author have for his tea? Good. In fact, actually, before I say that, um, you you, you don't say dinner now. You're not going to all posh on me, have you? Oh, I, I'm afraid, Solly. Sometimes I even say supper. We sometimes. Oh, me, Philip. <laughs> we should we should have started with this question. It would have been a lot shorter <laughs> of a conversation. <laughs> no, but what what do I have for my tea? So so today because I'm on holiday, we've gone kind of out of the normal sequence of of, of what we have for our tea. So I'm actually going to have steak and chips today for tea. I'm going to make it. Um, so my although my my daughter, my youngest daughter, is still at home. Um, she she has to have a vegan version because she's actually a vegan. So uh, the the meat eaters, my wife and I, will have a, a nice. Um, uh, fillet steak and uh, and my daughter will have the corn equivalent. No, very good. Well, thank thank you for, thank you for sharing that. And and on, honestly, I just want to say thank you for for sharing your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure to to talk with you, understand more about you, your journey, and and I guess the the selfless selfless nature of yourself, um, the importance of authenticity, the uh, life in balance. Um, which I, I think is a really, really important lesson as well. So I just want to say thank you so much for everything that you've shared today and also sharing in your books and what you do. Um, if people wanted to know more about Philip, where would they go? What would they do? What would they find? And where can they get this latest book from? So obviously LinkedIn, you can see my profile on LinkedIn very easily. Um, I do have a website, leadingwithlean.com. Um, so that's that's easy enough, and that has all the information on me and my my free box. Um, it also has the information on where you can buy them from, of course, Amazon. Um, and what is it they always say? And all good booksellers. <laughs> uh, you've done this before, haven't you? You've done this before. Uh, on, honestly, Philip, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. Enjoy the rest of your holiday, and I look forward to uh, to chatting to you again. Thank you very much, Lee. It's been a pleasure.